you will hear a woman asking a shop assistant about DVD players. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 4. Hello, I'm interested in buying a DVD player. Can you help me, as I don't know very much about them? Of course. We sell quite a range. Actually, we're doing a customer survey at the moment, so I wonder if I could fill in this form about you, and that will actually help me to advise you on the best DVD player for you. Oh, OK. <laughs> First of all, your occupation. Um, student. OK. Then, have you already got a DVD player? Uh, no, I've never had one before. Uh-huh. And how much do you think you want to spend on a player? Mm, I'm not sure, really. But I have got a budget. My friend said I should allow about £100. But I can't afford over £85, so that's what I'm working on. Mm-hmm. And... Do you watch DVDs very often? Um, depends what you mean by often. I don't know what the norm is. Is it about two a week? Uh, I suppose I watch three a month. That's enough for me. Yes. <laughs> what sort of films do you like watching then? Action movies? <laughs> Not really. Oh. My boyfriend always insists we watch science fiction movies, but... I prefer thrillers. Something to get your teeth into. OK. Just one more. Do you watch other DVDs, ones that are not films, like music or something? Not much, because I don't want to spend the money on something I can watch on TV, but I occasionally rent out comedy programmes, and I fight with my boyfriend over all the sports DVDs he watches. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 5 to 10. OK, let me explain a bit to you about the DVD players that are in your price range. First, there's the DB30, which has only got basic features, but it is a bargain at £69. Now, all the DVDs come with an after-sales service that starts when the guarantee runs out. As it's so cheap, the DB30 comes with a limited after-sales service, as it only includes parts. You would have to pay for most of the repair. Mm, mm, seems OK. Mm. Then a slight grade up from that is the XL643. This comes with an additional feature in that it has an extra button allowing you to record. That's quite useful. Oh, yes. That would mean spending less on DVDs to watch. Yes. So you'd make the extra money back on it that it costs. Mm. Let me see how much it is. Uh, ah, yes, that one's actually reduced at the moment from £79 to seventy-one ninety-nine. Oh. I think it's worth the extra myself. And is that the same level of after-sales service as the other one? Well, you get a bit more for your money because what we're offering is a discount on labour. So you don't pay the full price if you have to call an engineer out. I see. Then the last one is this Tri-X 24. It's a very good player, and you can use it to listen to your CDs as well as watch DVDs. Mm, it looks nice, but I 
bet it's expensive. No, it's not top of the range. Let's see. Yes, it's £94. But what you have to remember is that that includes insurance, so you don't have to pay extra for that. And it comes with a guarantee that's valid for three years, as opposed to the usual one. What do you think? Hmm, maybe... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a trainer giving a talk to people who want to learn outdoor survival skills. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our outdoor survival program. As you know, this week you'll be learning some of the basic information and skills you need to look after yourself independently in the outdoors. These first two days, we'll be based here in the classroom and then we'll be taking a camping trip to put into practice some of the things you've learned. I'm going to start off with the topic of food. And to start with, I'll describe just two methods which we'll be putting into practice at our camp and which make use of natural resources, the steam pit and the bamboo pot. I've got two posters here to make things clearer, and I'll start with the steam pit here. To make this, you'll need some dry sticks, some grass, some loose earth, and some stones. And for this week only, some matches. <laughs> the first thing you do is to dig a shallow pit in the place you've chosen to do your cooking. Let's say about 25 centimeters deep and 30 centimeters wide. Your sticks have to be a bit wider than the pit because you have to put a line of them along the top from one end of the pit to the other. Before setting light to these, you take some large stones and arrange them on top. Then you start the fire and wait till the wooden platform burns through and the stones fall into the pit. At this point, brush away any pieces of hot ash from the stones. You can use a handful of grass and then take another stick and push it down into the center of the pit between the stones. After that, you cover the whole pit with a thick layer of grass. And then you can put your food on it, wrapped in more pieces of grass like parcels. Finally, cover the whole thing with earth. You have to pat it firmly to seal the pit. Then all you have to do is take the stick out and pour a bit of water into the opening that it leaves. It should take about four hours for your food to cook as it cooks slowly in the steam that's created inside the pit. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So, simple but effective. The other method you're going to practice this week is the bamboo oven. Now, the steam pit is ideal in certain conditions because the heat is below ground level. For example, if there's a strong wind and you're afraid a fire might spread. But when it's safe to have an open fire, you can use the bamboo oven method. You get a length of bamboo, which, as you probably know, is hollow and consists of a number of individual sections with a wall in between. You use a sharp stick to make a hole in each of the dividing walls apart from the end one. Then you lean the bamboo over a fire, with the top propped up by a forked stick and the bottom sitting on the ground. You pour enough water in the top to fill the bottom section and then light a fire underneath that section to heat the water. Then you put your food inside the top section and the steam coming up the bamboo through the holes you made cooks it. I'm going to move on now to food itself and talk about some of the wild plants you might cook. I'm going to begin with fungi. That's mushrooms and toadstools. I'm sure you'll be aware that some of these are edible and they're delicious, but some of them are highly poisonous. Now, whether they're poisonous or not, all fungi that you find in the wild should be cooked before eating because that helps to destroy any compounds in them that might be mildly toxic. But be aware that any amount of cooking won't make poisonous varieties any safer to eat. Unless you can definitely identify a fungus, you should never eat it. It's not worth the risk. And you need to be really sure because some fungi that are poisonous are very similar in appearance to certain edible varieties. They can easily be mistaken for each other. So, having said all that, fungi are delicious when they're freshly picked, and although they are only moderately nutritious, they do contain minerals which the body needs. I'll move on now to leafy plants, which are generally... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student, Penny, talking to two friends, Ray and Louise, about a television competition Ray has entered called Travel Documentary. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi. Haven't seen you two in ages. What have you been up to? Hi, Penny. Ray is really excited. He's just been shortlisted for travel documentary. He could be off travelling around the world for three months. Travel documentary? What's that? You've never heard of it? Don't you watch TV? Well, actually, no, hardly ever, especially since I've started working on my thesis. I don't have time to breathe, let alone watch TV. So what's this all about, Ray? Well, actually, it, it's a competition run by Public TV. 
It involves my two great loves, travel and filmmaking. Is it that program where people are sent around the world making documentary videos? I have heard of it. Fantastic! So you've been chosen? Not yet. I'm one of 34 selected for an interview next week, so I've made it through the first cut. Yeah, there were over 200 applicants from around the country. Pretty amazing, hey? Well, I've been lucky so far. What's the next stage? 13 are chosen from the interview to do a four-week training course in documentary filmmaking. Then, the eight finalists get sent off with a video camera to travel around the world. Sounds incredible! What's the catch? The catch is that every two weeks you have to send in a 10-minute video from a different part of the world. It's broadcast on TV along with the work of three of the other competitors and judged by a panel of experts and the TV audience. So you're under a lot of pressure. Wow, I guess so. You mean you're on television every two weeks? Yep, that's right. But first, I have to be selected. Do you have to have any filmmaking experience to apply? Some background in photography or video making helps. But you're not supposed to be an expert. In fact, you can't apply if you've already worked in filmmaking. We all get the same four-week course, so we start with the same skills. Can you go anywhere in the world you want? Each competitor makes up his or her own travel plans and has to get them approved. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. Have you talked with anyone else who has done it? As a matter of fact, just last week, I met Sarah Price, a girl from here who did it last year. What did she have to say about it? She said it was the most amazing experience of her life, but it was really tough at times. I think you'd have to be really brave to take off like that alone with so much responsibility. It's not like going on a holiday, is it? <laughs> no. Two weeks in a country often where you can't speak the language to find a story, film it, organise all the editing. Then you're off to a completely different part of the world to start all over again. Pretty exhausting, but exciting too. What a way to see the world. What about Sarah Price? Did she have any bad experiences? She said the worst part was when she got some mysterious fever in Mongolia and thought she might have to be sent home. Fortunately, it got better, but she said it was scary to feel really ill when you're alone so far away. So what made you want to apply? When I saw the program on TV a while ago, I thought, this is for me. I've always wanted to travel, but needed to work for a year before I could even think about it. Then a new series started up. I thought, now's my chance. Don't you think you'll be lonely? I don't think I'll have time to be homesick. I'm more worried about having too much to do and not enough time to get things organised. So we might be watching you on television in the next few months? I hope so, if I'm lucky. When will you know for sure? They choose the final eight in March. A month later, you're on your way. So do you have to pay anything? Nothing. It's all paid for. Course, camera, flights, accommodation and in-country travel. The budget is pretty tight, though. No extras. I sure hope you get it. Then I'll be finding time to watch at least one program on television every week. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. This is Jane Frost with this morning's edition of Wake Up with Frost. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning. This is Jane Frost with this morning's edition of Wake Up with Frost. As you all know, for the last week we've been running a survey, trying to find out what you, the listeners, think is the greatest invention of the last two hundred years. The response has been amazing, double the amount we had last year. So thanks to all of you for taking part. We've had about two thousand responses online, and about the same on our phone lines. The lines are now closed, and this morning I can announce what the results were. So here it is: you, the listeners, have chosen as the greatest technological invention of the past two hundred years. And let me not forget to mention that sixty-five percent of you voted for this. It's the bicycle. Yes, the bicycle, first invented in eighteen eighteen, and would you believe it, the first bicycle was made of wood. The second bicycle had iron wheels. I cannot imagine what that must have been like to ride. It would have kept you fit at any rate. But for me, the best thing about the bicycle was what it did for women's rights. Yes, in the eighteen nineties, it was the bicycle that meant women could change their clothing, start wearing trousers or pantaloons, as they were known. Before then, women's clothes had been really uncomfortable, and I'd imagine quite difficult to breathe in. So, thanks to the ordinary bicycle, it was not only the man who wore the trousers in a home. Instead, women could now feel far more equal to their male contemporaries, and I'm sure you'll agree. The bicycle is a great way to get regular exercise, and of course, it's much better for the environment. And today, over one billion people all over the world ride bicycles, and for some, it's their only means of getting around from A to B. So, to all you bicycle riders out there, keep up the good work. Coming in a close second, with forty-two percent, is the computer. I found out something interesting about the computer, which is that really, this word first meant someone who did mathematical calculations. Of course, today, with the development of the personal computer, computers are being used for everything from home use to business and even digital photography. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine life without a computer now. I guess closely related to the computer is the internet. And this got twelve percent of your votes. Maybe, like myself, many of you might think of the internet as being the World Wide Web, but actually, the web is only one part of the internet. The internet began as part of the United States military network, but it later began to be used by businesses and academic institutions. Of course, today the internet has so many uses. We use it for shopping online and entertainment, as well as to find information and send emails. But sadly, there is a darker side to the internet, and some of you have sent me emails about this. Finally, with five percent of your votes, is the radio. We think the radio was invented by Marconi in 1896, and he opened his first radio or wireless factory in the United Kingdom in 1898. In 1906, a man called Reginald Fessenden gave the first radio broadcast from Massachusetts. Ships could hear him at sea, and apparently he played the violin. As yet, listeners. I've spared you from having to listen to my guitar playing, but certainly radio is still important. 
Let's not forget that it was by radio that the Titanic sent signals to other ships. And with the popularity of TV today, I was secretly pleased so many of you had still placed importance on the radio. So there you have it: the results of our survey. I think there are still important inventions that were not chosen but deserve a mention: nuclear power and, of course, communication satellite. Something which I am certain will continue to change the face of how we communicate with each other over both long and short distances. In fact, for me, the mobile phone is one of the greatest inventions of the last two hundred years. If I think back to my first phone, and then I look at what is happening now, children born today will probably be more likely to have their first experience of the internet on a mobile phone screen rather than a computer monitor. Some of the new mobiles that are now being sold make it just as easy and as quick to find information on the web as on a computer. And let's not forget that mobiles now have digital cameras, word processing facilities, so you can type all your documents, and even personal organizers. I think it's quite possible that the mobile may even replace computers one day. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.